Hey, what's up online community? And thanks for stopping by and checking out another segment of Straight No Chaser, where I talk sports and culture for fans all the time with the fans. Now, tonight I, I had initially planned to talk about what was going on in the world of sports because sports is back with us. We've got Major League Baseball that's up and going, hockey, the NBA bubble, the NFL is now reporting for NFL training camps, as well as the uh, NCAA is trying to figure out what they're going to do as far as uh, football for the fall season. But here in Chicago, we're facing a more uh, pressing conversation. That is, what is going on in the city of Chicago? And to join me with, with, for tonight's conversation, I have a good friend of mine, Derek Anderson. You guys have seen him. He's been in part of our other conversations as it relates to sports. But this is a guy who mentors uh, many young men. Uh, he's helped me. He's mentored me in some, in some ways and helped me grow as an individual. Uh, we also have uh, Shanir Austin, uh, who's a pastor here in Chicago. He pastors a church on the south side of Chicago. And he has also been in contact with many of the individuals, not directly in contact, but um, he works in he, his church in the community with the individuals that have been impacted and been part of uh, some of the nefarious actions here in Chicago um, over the past couple of days as it relates to the looting and rioting that's been going on in downtown. But before we get into it, let's do as we always do. Let's raise our glass and we get into a straight note chaser. So to the pastor, to the pastor who doesn't drink. So. Guys, so the past couple, I mean, over the over the past couple of months, we've just experienced a lot of turmoil. There's been a lot of protests um, as it relates to George Floyd, civil unrest, social injustice, things like that. Things have kind of hit a little bit of, of a lull period. And then lo and behold, we had another shooting, officer involved shooting on the south side of Chicago. Now, the details of that shooting um, are kind of all over the place. There's a lot of information, a lot of misinformation that's being put out there. I don't really want to go into the details of the shooting aspect, so to speak, but I want to talk about what's happened after that. And that is we've seen what appears to be coordinated rioting, coordinated looting, uh, not just well, primarily in the downtown Chicago area, but then also in some of the other communities. And I want us to have a real brutally honest conversation about the state of the city of Chicago in terms of what, what does it look like when we talk about Chicago? How do we move forward? And what are some of the challenges and things that are plaguing us? So before we get into it, let me just ask you, Derek, and I'll, and I'll come to Shanir. Derek, you have a lot of friends outside of the city of Chicago and a lot of uh, conversation happens. I've seen some of the things on social media. When someone asks you about Chicago, how do you describe it now? When they ask you about some of the things that are happening as it relates to the protests, the rioting, the shootings, things like that, how do you describe the city of Chicago? I tell them that it's uh, it's not all bad. First thing I say, because the media portrays us as being, you know, this is this is the hot spot of badness on the, in the media. You know what I'm saying? So I tell them it's not all bad, but it's rough times. We're going through rough times. So I let them know that. And I just, uh, I tell them don't believe everything you hear, but you can believe some of them <laughs> because it's just nothing that we can, uh, it's rough times right now. So when 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 they when they see the the video clips of people running in stores and ramming store windows with cars and it kind of reaffirms their thoughts in terms of Chicago being a dangerous place or um, this is kind of the capital of civil unrest because you've got looting and rioting that's that's happening. How do you, how do you have that? How do you counter that conversation? It, and it's it's very difficult when you see that. You see what I'm saying? That's that's the place that you put us in when we, when we talking to other people, you know, um, people think that Chicago is all that. So, um, I try to assure them that it's not, but when we looking at it right now, right. it's just what we see, what they see, what they see on TV, what they, and it's been happening like this around Chicago for years, but, um now it's just at a at a different level and sometimes you know you're at a loss for words for the stuff you see so i sometimes i don't even know how to explain it to them you know i just shake my head and be like man i'm living in it it's rough <laughs> you know and, and and you know we're going to come back to that because you, you hit something you hit it right on the head and that is and i find myself in a similar situation that is i just kind of shake my head sometimes and throw my hands up because there isn't an explanation. I don't have an explanation because I'm in the throes of it, but I know it doesn't feel good. I know it doesn't feel right. 
and I know it's not a proper representation of the city that I love, the city that I grew up in. No. Right. Shinier, um, you're a pastor on the south side of Chicago, and you work in one of the more challenging communities. Um, so you have a little bit more firsthand account um, interactions, uh, firsthand information uh, than the average person, so to speak, or more so uh, than someone on social media that may be in another state or another or suburb that may be con commenting on inner city issues and challenges. How do you have a conversation? What would be the conversation that you would have with someone if they would ask you, what's the state of Chicago like now? Is it as rough or as bad as it is? Well, I agree with my brother Derek that not all parts are bad, not all, all things are bad, but it's challenging right now that um, I, I, I just believe Chicago is living up to its, its, its nature that it breeded for so many years from all, dating all the way back to the Al Capone days, you know, mm -hmm. you know, from Al Capone to, you know, gang, you know, gangland, all this stuff, you know, it was never properly dealt with. And I think we're just, you know, just seeing the harvest of that stuff is still here. And so I, I tell people like this, man, it's, it's a it is a challenge. It's a challenging, it's a very challenging place. Um, not all places are bad, but right now our city is challenged and you have to make a decision if you want to come here. You know, it's not what the media portraying to be that you can't literally walk down the street. You can walk down the street. Yeah. It's just that there are certain parts that are, are very challenging. There are certain things that are happening in our city that's just very unsavory, so. Yeah, great, I think those are both good points. And I wanna to get to the elephant in the room. Let's just jump right to it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a young man, and, and again, I'm just going by information that I've been able to glean um, off the internet um, and as well as the news. Um, and I don't wanna get into the specifics of it, but just, just to summarize an overview. So apparently there was a young man who was, um, who was shot and killed, or I'm sorry, shot, not killed, um, at the hands of a police officer. Uh, the details, again, there's a lot of information out there. I don't know what's 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 what. Uh, that's not for me to decide. I don't, I don't know the young man, but I do know the after effects. And the after effects that I'm seeing is a lot of civil unrest, a lot of violence, and um, a lot of rioting and looting. The challenge that I have is having that conversation with people to say that, let me, let me take a step back. Let me rephrase what I was gonna say. Looking at how this has, has been handled, do you think the rioting and the violence that has followed up has been the correct answer? And let me start with Shanir and I'll go to Derek. Not at all. I, you know, I'm totally against this whole looting thing. And I understand um, oppressed people and the nature of oppressed people and how they respond to oppression. But, you know, bro, there's a difference between systematic racial oppression and self-oppression. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to self-oppression, that's you choosing to oppress yourself into ignorance. You choosing to do things that incarcerate you and enslaves you, and you're choosing to be in a certain predicament or, or place. This this looting stuff, man, that was not the answer. It's not the answer because um, it affects us in so many ways. It affects everybody across the board. You know, yeah. I um I put up a post the other day and I said something about it. And a young lady got on and she she was going back and forth <clears throat> with me about the whole situation. I told her, I said, listen, let me tell you something. She said, you know, we need to hit those white people where they hurt. I said, sweetheart, I said, they're not just hitting one group of people. It's affecting us all. Yes. You know, you had um, brothers, um, Geek Squad brothers. They got, I mean, not Geek Squad brothers, um, um, Fashion Geek, their stores got hit. My um, buddy, agriculture in um, in, um, in 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 Bronzeville, his store got hit. You know, this is not. You know, you don't you don't address criminality by committing criminal acts. Yes. And this situation, especially this situation, I understood the George Floyd, but this situation here is totally different. You know, they're rioting for all the wrong reasons, and I'll say this, and I'll let my brother Derek take it from here. I don't understand how you can get so upset over a young man from what I'm hearing shot back at the police, from what I'm seeing on his Facebook page. You know, he, he toting all these these um, pistols and stuff like that. And then you, you, you're you mad because this is like he's choosing to live. But no one got that upset when all these little babies were murdered. I mean, murdered, man. No one no one went out and looted then. And, and it's it's a it's a 
element of criminality and that's just that's the way it is and you can't solve a problem by creating a problem you right. cannot and so I, I i'm totally against it i think it's the most ignorant thing i think it's a sign of self-oppression and it's not a sign of systematic or racial oppression this is a sign of self-oppression and we need to I, I think that that issue definitely needs to be dealt with uh Derek, go ahead and i have a couple thoughts yeah um what um Shanir was talking about what the elements of the that um chicago has lived by the gangster elements and things like that uh those things have not been ad been addressed and also i mean we got a whole element of things when you take away leadership from back in the day like the fred hamptons and things like that when those people start this is what it's led up to like i was telling somebody before uh all the things that happened back in the, this is what it's led up to man. so the things that we're seeing right now i of course i don't agree with it i think it's i think it's horrible i think it's the oppressed oppressing the oppressed you see okay. what i'm saying Can you elaborate on that for, for the people that are watching well we are oppressed people black people in inner cities we are oppressed people we have we get angry at certain things or certain racial elements of this world certain certain things of oppression that we see that we feel we get upset as a people then there's certain elements of us in our in our community that go out and take advantage of that yeah. and they take advantage of it and they go out and they take jobs away from us. They go out and like he said, they have, like Sunil said, they affect all of us, not just white people. We trying to hit white people where it hurt. Well, wait, how you know where it hurt at? Do you exactly. really do you really know where it hurts at? Because what you doing, you ain't hurting, you ain't hurting now. What you could what you're doing is finna bring more oppression. Yes. That's what you're finna do. You're finna bring more oppression. I was telling you earlier, Stan, about, you know, it's for years they've been talking about making us pay to get into downtown. For years they've been talking about this. This has been the underlying thing for years. I mean, for at least since 2008, 2009, they've been trying to figure out a way to do it. We're giving them a way to do it. Well, you can no longer move around the city like you want to. So it's... I, I, I see it happening, and I and the part that we plan in it is sad. It's sad. So let me and, and, I, and I agree with both your points. Let me touch on something that Shanir said, and Derek, I'm going to come to you. I'm, I'm going to touch on something that you said. And one of the things that I think we are seeing is the manifestation of not addressing um, trauma within the community. I think you're seeing what this looks like when people that and I, I, I've been a big proponent of having this discussion that is addressing the PTSD that occurs in the African-American community, um, whether it be through violence um, from resident to resident, community member to community member, or by others that are not part of the community where it's outside or law enforcement, whatever the case would be. But there is trauma within the African-American community that is that not addressed. It what is trauma that is that, that African-Americans, people in general, but in general, the African-Americans, um, they are subjugated to because of the violence around them and they don't know how to express themselves. When I say they, meaning, meaning me being a person of color as well. Um, but how do, you, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with the pain and the hurt that you are dealing with internally? Um, how do you deal with the volatility of a situation within the community that it, at a moment's notice could go up like that. And I think that's one of the challenges um, that, that the African-American community is facing. And that is, and you're seeing a manifestation of it, of what happened um, you know, a couple of days ago. You know, they're hurting, people were hurt, right or wrong, the effect was people were upset, people were angered, and people were hurt. And they didn't know how to deal with that, how to address that. So how did they go about doing it? The best way that they know or what the, what's familiar to them. Violence, rioting, destruction, things like that. 
also within that within that group of individuals that are hurting there are opportunists there are people that are looking to take advantage of the situation you know let's call it what it is they're looking for the come up and i think that's one of the more challenging things as we start to see more and more occurrences like this and that is how do you deal and how do you address with the opportunists that are that are suffocating the conversations that need to be had because we're spending more time, whether it's through social media, whether it's through the media, whether it's through um, the, 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 our local politicians offices or police department on dealing with the, the issues of the after effect as opposed to what the cause and effect of it was, if that makes sense to you. So I think to your point, you know, Shanir, we are dealing with some level of PTSD. We are dealing with trauma within the community. I think, Derek, to your point, I think you hit on something, and that is this is going to lead to other forms of oppression, whether it be you brought up an example of access. Access is a form of oppression. You know, if you don't have access to a physical space, a location, things like that, that can bring a whole, another set of challenges of, of a sort. Um, it could be financial oppression because now some of those businesses in the community that have been that have been destroyed, some of them, you know, they may bounce back. Some of them have been destroyed. Some of them have, may decide to move out. Guess what? That's a tax. That's tax dollars that are now removed from that community. Now the economic base of that community is being impacted. So now that's another form of financial oppression because you don't have the resources, the financial resources going back into that community to be able to um, put together, put things in place uh, from a social services standpoint or uh, civil services or just whatever opportunities that are created through those financial resources. You know, those are some of my initial thoughts when I hear this conversation and, as we have this dialogue. Derek, I know, you, I know you were holding in on something. Go ahead. No, um, my my. My thoughts on that is is it's true. It's all it's all kinds of a, a oppression that will come from it, and I do understand the uh, trauma that uh, the black community has been going through over over at least my fifty years that I've been here. You know the trauma I understand, but you know it's it's an element of life, man, that we got to live. You know. All, after all these things, see, this is my thing. Where's the end game? Yes. To what you're doing? Because yes. it's an element of life that we all have to live. Okay, once you take the jobs away, once you take the jobs away, certain businesses don't come back. We can't get downtown. Access is gone. Uh, police force is ramped up. What do we gain? What do we have, what do we have left? What I see things that are being taken away. I think I see things that's going to be taken away. What did you gain? Especially if you still got to live here. You can't go nowhere. You still got to live here. So it's just it's just an element of stupidity that I don't understand. And then for you to come together as a group and go on social media and things like that. You go on social media and say, meet me downtown. Mm -hmm. Meet us downtown. We finna riot downtown. I mean, come on, man. That's not that's not a protest. No, no, that's not a protest. That's that's some that's that's gang activity. You see what I'm saying? That's gang activity. We finna go over here and we and man, you talking to me? I, and I know the streets, Shania. I know you do. You know what I'm saying? We know the streets, man. This ain't, this ain't that, bro. You see what I'm saying? This ain't, this ain't no feel good story, man. This, this right here is something that's, uh, it's going to lead us down a worse road. That's all I see. And I think to your point, Derek, you know, you, you hit it on the head. And that is, you know, when it's all said and done, you still have to live there. And it's not even about, at this point, it's not even about gaining anything. It's about maintaining what you have. Because at this point, there's a lot of loss. And yeah. I don't know if in these, in these, through this conversation and through the actions that will occur, if those businesses will come back, if those communities will bounce back, if the trust among uh, people will bounce back. 
and there's a lot that can be lost. And to your point, yeah, we may not gain anything, but are we even able to maintain what we had going into this? Let's and that. that's going to be the challenge. And you're talking about a, a group of individuals. You're talking about communities that were already challenged as it was, as it re related to financial resources, social service resources, retail, jobs, um, opportunities, things like that. That's going to be a huge challenge. And I think you hit it right on the head. I do want to kind of move it to... Let me, let me, you know, I want to say some real, real fast because you hit a point about, you know, how to address it. I think that, you know, you know, I'm an African American preacher, so I, I have to say, Jesus said something so powerful in John eight. He said, "The truth shall set you free." Um, understanding truth in in order to embrace truth and experience the liberating power of truth, I've come to a realization: you have to know what what's a lie, you know, and and what's not what's not truth and what's not truthful and what's not, um, um, what doesn't provide a level of, of freedom through truth. Mm -hmm. And I think what's, what's happening today, man, is that we lack leadership that understands what liberating truth is. Yes. We lack, we lack people who would say, like I, you know, I, I heard a, a activist stand up, uh, get on the radio, man, it bothered me so much because this person gets up, he says, you know, he started addressing these issues of we need more jobs in the community and all this stuff. Derek and I, y'all, you know, we, we know each other's stories. Stan, you, you said yeah. you have front row to our stories. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Dude, when, when I was in the street, I'm going to be honest with you. Why did I go to the street? Because I wanted quick money. I wanted fast money. And I wanted real money. Half of these guys, man, that are out here in these streets, it's not because you're not providing a job for them. It's because you're not providing the right type of money for right. them. And they're looking for things the easy way and the quick way. So right. how do you? We we have to be truthful in addressing those issues and not and 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 stop trying to give people some level that this was what's going to cure the problem. Because bro, I, I'm all for more jobs coming to the hood. I'm with that. I really believe that we need to provide some level of uh, economic growth in the form of of job job provision for our people. But also, man, we 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 need to address where this stuff is stemming from. And what's happening is that it's not starting because there's a lack of a job in the hood. It's not starting from because there are no social services in the hood. It's starting because, man, there's a bad house in the hood. There's a bad home in the hood. There's a mother who's allowing her son to, to store AK-47s under her under his bed, bed that she's paying the rent in the house. We need to address this parenting system that, that's totally fractured in our community, man. I think that's a starting point. The other stuff is great. Those are the things that, that those social services can help in the parenting thing. But yes. the thing that changed my life, man, was the one thing I had to do in order for my life to be changed is embrace God's truth for my life. That I can't keep doing it this way because this is what it bought me. This is what it got me. This is what it this is where it landed me. So at some point, man, those, and I was sharing this with you earlier, Stan, people who have platforms need to stand up and tell the truth. Because we need to stand up and say, our leaders need to stand up and say, hey, listen, this is not right. This is what you need to do. Don't be, we, we don't address, we don't need to loot and destroy our communities because we are suffering behind this. And I just think that, man, with all of this stuff, and we need to tell the truth that, and be honest that, hey, listen, our people need psychological help. Because, yes. man, we suffered, we suffered trauma for years. I would never undermine what we went through with the Jim Crow, the slavery and all that, I would never undermine that. And I, and anyone, and I tell, you know, my white colleagues this all the time, that man, don't ever undermine what we went through by telling us, I'll just get over it. Yes. Because that's just like you telling the captain of a cruise ship, turn his ship around in 2.7 seconds. It's not gonna happen, you know? And so trauma, you have to deal with it in its, in increments, you have to deal with it on its levels of severe severity, you know, because there's um, levels of trauma. And so you have to, we, we need to, it's okay to go to counseling, man. It's okay to sit down and get some help for that stuff that's up in your head and in your heart, man. You know, and to that point, uh, we've, and we got some, we've got a lot of feedback on the, on the live feed. I'm just gonna touch into some of these. Uh, Charlie Smile is watching. Um, she's, she's actually, she, she actually mentioned that she's addressed that um, and brought that up. And that is you can't ignore the multi-generational multi trauma that African-Americans have experienced within their community. I think, you, I think you hit it on the head. I think she brought it up. I think it's a great point. 
because now there, there's research and there's information out there that says it's now wired within your DNA. Not that it's an excuse, but then also it's something again that, that, that needs to be addressed and needs to be, be discussed. Um, getting over the stigma that um, mental support in the African-American community is not a sign of weakness. It is more of a sign of strength because you're acknowledging Absolutely. that you need help, that you need to, that you need additional support to address those challenges. Um, we were talking about some of those businesses and I want to kind of go and move, it'll segue into our next point of conversation. We we're talking about some of those business, businesses closing. Um, Charlie Smile mentioned that um, the Dollar Tree on 72nd in Stony Island um, hasn't opened and they probably won't reopen. I know as I've driven through parts of the city of Chicago, even here in the South Suburban area where looting took place that, you know, you would think that these individuals, they weren't from our community. And I say our community because I live uh, just outside of Chicago, but there were people that were driving cars and you know your area, who, who looks and fits into your area and who doesn't. And I saw people, and I, and I shared this on another, on another uh, discussion, I saw people, you know, dr driving up with cars, getting out, running into stores, and then taking off. These didn't look like the people in my community that I normally see. I'll just leave it at that. But I say that to say, many of these businesses have not recovered from the first set of um, looting and issues and things like that. Now they've undergone a second wave, and now the expectation is that they're going to come back. If they did not come back, I would not be surprised. And I think for us to just assume that these places that have insurance um, and that have suffered devastation are just automatically inclined to say, well, you know what? Yeah, I'm just gonna go back there because gosh darn it, that's the place for me to be. No, they're gonna make a business decision. And that is, is this a place where I can operate a business? Is this a place that is safe for me? Is this a place more importantly that appreciates what I'm trying to do and that I can get a dollar from? Because ultimately it is a business. And these are the things that go into running a business. You need, first of all, the financial support. You need the safety to know that your business will be there. And then also the safety for yourself as an individual. And these are things that are not taken into consideration when looting happens, when rioting happens. And for us to just make a, a, a broad assumption that these businesses will be back because they have insurance is not the case. Many of these businesses have to make a hard decision. And if it means that they have to relocate to another city the part of the city or the suburbs or another state, that may be something that's on the table for them. Definitely. And I, and I believe that that will happen to some. Um, you you got to realize, when you own a business, when, and this type of thing happens to you, if it happens to you once, you know, you're, you're discouraged. It happened to you twice. Hey, man, you got to really love that community to come back, bro. You see what I'm saying? You got to really love that community to come back. Yes. So, now, don't get me wrong. There could be money made in any community. But if this happens to you, like, I, and I'm a black person, you black, you, you, you guys are black men, would you be thinking twice about Absolutely. bringing your business to that community? You would be. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? You would be then it would only be smart for you to think twice you see what i'm saying so you know we can't expect somebody who don't look like us to be like readily ready to go back into the fire see you all these things you got to think about when you make these stances when you do what you do you know and it's it's hurtful man you know when i think about it it's hurtful <clears throat> i know people who have actually lost their jobs yes uh, I know young men who got off the street, who was working, who lost their jobs. You see what I'm saying? Now, what element did you, what position did you put them in? You see what I'm saying? They might have to go back to the streets. Great point. And you see what I'm saying? So, oh, go ahead. No, it's just, it's just when we do things like this as a community, man, it destroys. It don't, it don't help. It hurts us. Man. That's all I. It hurts us, bro. You and know? I think it's, it's to your point earlier, you made the comment, you know, before we really got into the conversation, and that was, you don't know who it hurts. You just may see opportunity. You may see, you know, the, the, the minimal dollar signs, because I say minimal, you're still in a pair of shoes or a television set, whatever you're selling it for on Craigslist or eBay or let go, whatever, it's all, it's all going to be a minimal return. But you're just seeing that small opportunity, but not realizing the larger impact 
that it's going to have in that community because these businesses may not come back. And if they do come back again, now they got to raise prices because they, their insurance rates have gone up or, you know, they got a higher security now. So the prices are going to go up. So again, everything has a cause and effect to it. Um, you know, a good example of that was Kenwood Liquors on Stony Island. One of our viewers brought that up and that is Kenwood Liquors. Stony Island, they made tons of money. They're not coming back. They're, they're not coming back. There's, not I mean, back. There, there's a lot of businesses like that, but that's the one I, I know of, like, you know, one of the viewers brought it up, but I know that for a fact because I've driven down Stony and I've seen cars, you know, backed up for blocks, you know, trying to get into the parking lot for the liquor store, you know, but that's just another example. So, you know, as we're talking about that and what the community impact is, I want to talk about, you know, what that may look like for downtown, because my concern is this is the second wave of, um, this is the second wave of looting that's occurred in less than a month, month and a half. And my concern is that at some point, if this continues or companies that haven't recovered from the first wave now experience the second wave of looting, Will they pull out of downtown Chicago? And will downtown Chicago become, for lack of a better term, desolate? Um, lack of businesses? Like, you know, I know it's a sensitive, sensitive area, but, you know, will it become the next Detroit where you've got businesses that are pulling out? Or you've got, you know, the, the, the people that are stop downtown. People that, that's the other thing, too, that we haven't talked about. And that is you know, the fear of shopping downtown or spending that time downtown because they're getting away from their community or they just want to have a, a nice time away from the suburbs or just get out the house. You know, man, let me, let me say this. This, this is what, this, this is what people don't realize, you know, having businesses, you know, when that looting occurs, of course, insurance is involved. Yes. So these insurance companies are not going to keep paying out millions yes. and millions of dollars. So they're going to start putting certain clauses in their insurance policies that doesn't afford these businesses the opportunity to recover from looting. Yes. And so the reality is that, you know, you can't keep smacking a person in the mouth and think they're gonna just stand there and, and yeah. keep taking it. It's right. not that, and you know, and I felt, you know, I, one day I was downtown, man, I was eating dinner at, at a very nice restaurant and I saw some young people come in there. They were dressed nice and they were eating. And I was just like really proud of that moment. Cause I'm saying, man, look at our, you know, our young people out here doing fine dining, you know what I'm saying? I know what I paid for that plate. So I know what they paid for that plate, you know what I'm saying? And it was really encouraging. But then I'm saying to myself, we've come a long way, but now we have people pushing us back further now. Yes. Because I truly believe you, Gucci has been hit to my understanding that I can think of at least five times. I was just going to say five, at least. At least five times. And you're not going to keep hitting those businesses. The insurance companies are not going to keep saying, okay, we'll keep giving you money. We we'll keep giving you money so that you can recover. At some point, they're gonna say, "Hey, listen, enough is enough. Pull out of there because this is not beneficial for us, yep. and it's not beneficial for." And, and man, let me tell you something. At the end of the day, we witnessed something right before our eyes. We saw a racial element with Gucci. We saw a racial element with Prada. Don't think that that has been totally eradicated. And so don't think for one second, they're going to say, hey, listen, we see who's running up in our stores. So if they want to keep doing this, let's take it to another area where we don't have to worry about them running up in our stores. Yes. Because here it is, they've been granted access to come to these certain places. But now let's go to a place where we feel or we deem is safe for our business to thrive, stuff like that. So I, I truly believe that if this keeps happening, you know, we're going to see a major shift downtown i mean bro listen when was the last time you heard somebody getting murdered in, on, on oak street you no. never heard that i, I never, that. I, never. I, I, never. I, I never heard that i've never heard of a person being murdered on oak street and see to us we may look at it like okay dude got killed he got you know he was they saw him they did what they did but to People who've been in that area, who live in that area, who paid all that money for that area to be down in that area, they look at it like one time is too many. Yes. Yeah. And so now yeah. we need to change the whole dynamic of what's going on down here. So see, I think it, I, I think eventually it's going to change. But see, that's what I was telling you. That's what I was. See, Chicago has already took a hit uh, as far as downtown yeah. goes. Remember State Street? 
Remember how State Street used to be thriving? You yeah. know, back in the day, you go on State Street by anything, right? State Street is nothing like it used to be, okay? So we already know that from Van Buren on up, it's nothing like it used to be. Now, you're talking about all these things happening. What they're going to do is take back downtown. You see what I'm saying? The access to it will not be readily available to everyone. Don't be surprised in a few years if everything is still going the way it's going. In a few years, yeah, Gucci will be downtown, but it's going to cost you $10 to drive into downtown. You see what I'm saying? That's that's what they're going to do. They're going to, yes, we're going to, things are going to be missing for a while. Gucci said, we ain't going to come back for a while. Chicago, the government, Chicago, the city of Chicago, the elements under it, be like, we can't do that, man. We need that money. So what they're going to do is say, if you want to come in here and shop, if you want to come in here and stay, if you want to come in here and enjoy the elements of downtown Chicago, you got to pay. You got to pay to get in here. That It's been on the table for a long time, like I'm saying. And now we just gave them the door to do it. You see what I'm saying? It's Chicago is going to change. It's going to change whether you want, to, want it to change or not. But then we're going to be gonna crying change. racism. We're going to cry that they're racist. Oh, no. but, but see, yeah. and that, that right there is... When people say, oh, you're doing the devil's work. You're doing, you're doing the racist work. Mm -hmm. You're doing the work so those, that's what's happening. You see what I'm saying? You're doing, you're giving them the ability. And like you said, we're going to cry. Oh, that's racist for y'all to do that to us. That's racist. No, man. You played a part in it. You so played I a part in it. Go so ahead. I do agree with your point. That is, you know, you, you're talking about what it sounds like you're saying is there, there would be like a, a toll or something. Like if you came into the downtown area, there'd be like a toll or some type yeah. of some type of fee or something. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, that's that's something that could be on the table. I mean, I'm, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. But I'm, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if anything happens because downtown is kind of the bread and butter of Chicago in terms of gener rev rev no, generating revenue. I will. Yes. I am confident in saying that moving forward, it will not look and feel the same. Whether no. it's more officers on the street, whether it's more, for lack of a better term, stop and frisk, whether it's more um, scrutiny. I don't know. I know at one point the water tower, you had to be, if you were under the age of 18, I believe, or 17, you had to be escorted. Um, you know, some areas I know, some areas they have, you know, you have to be escorted by an adult. Um, you can't be in groups larger than three, four, whatever the case may be. But so there are some things that could be put in place uh, because of what has happened. So I am in agreement with it moving forward. It may look and feel different than what we've what we've been accustomed to. Um, it may not impact us directly as, as adults because we're not part of the demographic that they're targeting. But we may catch some of the, um, for like, but not the residual, but. Uh, just kind of the the brunt of like the the the, the, the side effect of it, for lack of a better term. Okay. We gonna catch it too, Stan. I mean, look at me. I'm walking. I'm round. I got a hat on backwards, man, with a chain on, and driving down the street. It's gonna be looking. They gonna be looking at people like me, even though I'm 50 years old and been working a job for who knows how long. Been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Who knows how long been out them streets, but they still gonna look at us, Stan. You see what I'm hey, saying? Stan, let me, let me ask you this, Stan. What, what, what would you, downtown in the Gold Coast area, Oak Street, all those high-end areas, Rush Street, what do, what, what area that comparative to in another state? What, what area would you say that's comparative to? Um, it's compared mm -hmm. to, so let's see, Chris, so let's, you can talk let's, about- Let's go California. I, I'll hit San California. Francisco, California, there's an area downtown uh, San Francisco that I've been to that's comparable. Um, there is an area in New York that's comparable to it where the Macy's is. It's comparable yes. to that. Um, I would also say the 
Oak Street area, the Magnificent Mile area is comparable to Collins Avenue. Is it Collins or Washington? One of the two down in Miami, South Beach. And uh, you would say it's comparable to Rodeo Drive, correct? Rodeo. Yeah, but yeah to an extent, yeah. Now, answer this question for me. Have you heard when the L.A. riots went on and when all this, this stuff happened, when people started looting in, in California, did you ever hear about them going to and work Rodeo Drive up? No. No. You want to know why? Because they 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 gonna protect their interest down there. That that's a multi-billion dollar area right there. And so don't think for one second that with downtown being comparable um, comparable um, comparable to um, Rodeo Drive, that is not going to be protected with the same. Man, you have people down there who live down there who have multi-million dollar condos. Yes. Who are saying who already have been on on, on the on the mayor's you know, on phone, say, hey, listen, we can't have this down here. Yep. You're not going to, you know, you got to do something. And it's going to change, man. And like you said, it's going to affect our children are majorly going to be fe- affected by it. We're going to feel some of the effects of it. You know what I'm saying? But our, mainly our children, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, just say you and Derek, y'all got, you know, you you raising your kids, right? You got good kids. You're doing your kids. And your kids are just, they have levels of morality to them. They going downstairs. I mean, they going downtown and all of a sudden, they're being chastised for the ignorance of other people. They're going right. downtown. They just want to enjoy a nice breezy day and all that stuff. But because of this ignorant element that's out here, they're going to suffer. And then when your children suffer, yes, it affects us as parents because we have to stand up for the rights of our children. So let's talk about that ignorance. Um, let's talk about what happened. Uh, what what What's today? What happened Sunday? So Sunday, and I'm, I'm, this is the information I was able to get off of social media. I've seen the screenshots, I've seen the videos of the coordinated efforts by these individuals to go downtown. And it was not it was not with the intent to protest. It was with the intent of destruction. One of the yeah. gentlemen on, uh, in, his, uh, in his video was like, hey, we're not tearing up our neighborhood. We're not tearing up the South Side. And, and again, I'm paraphrasing. We're not tearing up the South Side. We're not tearing up the West Side. We going downtown. Be ready. Bring your tools. We meeting at 12 a.m. What does that tell you? That is not about the protest. That is not about a movement. That is not about a cause. That is about stupidity, plain and simple. And that is about creating destruction and chaos. That is about taking advantage of the opportunity. And what I have found myself, and I I said that I wasn't going to talk about it on Monday, uh, just because I didn't want my spirit to to just be a a a place of unrest. But I had to end up having this conversation. And that was, when you have, when you go in with those intentions, when you go out to destroy, when you go out to cause mayhem, when you go out and you, your 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 desire is nothing but to take advantage of the opportunity, that is wrong. And when I hear people try and condone it, and we'll talk about, you know, you may want to touch on the activists who who talked who touched on it, but when I hear people trying to explain away this bad behavior, this terrible behavior. Shanir, if you weren't on the on, on the show with us, I'd use other words. But this trashy behavior, that's what frustrates me because now we're not talking about the cause. We're talking, and it, I, I don't even know if it was a cause, but now we're not talking about the issues. We're talking about the after effect of the destruction, chaos, and now the, the, the issues that are, are evolving because of that. What are your thoughts on that? When you hear people try and justify the looting that took place, the the uh, destruction, the chaos. Derek, what are your thoughts on this, Shanir? There is no justification. See, when you start talking about, when you start talking about people getting hurt and you got a movement going for, because somebody got hurt or you you got some unrest because somebody got hurt, that was, uh, George Floyd was innocent. He was innocent, regardless of what they said he did, whatever, the check or whatever, he didn't deserve what he got. This situation, what you got going on right now, what happened, there was no justification for it whatsoever. Whatsoever. So it was just an element, and I hate it, it was just an element of wickedness, man. That's what it was. People just got in their mind that they wanted to do, and a certain group of people got in their mind that they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And then they incited 
a riot. That's what they did. They incited a incited a riot so they can cover up what they were doing. Yes. People that went in there with U-Haul trucks showed up. You see what I'm saying? Um, different tools showed up to get in certain places. They took out safes, man, of businesses. Safes. You, you see what I'm saying? You didn't, they didn't break in the safe. We always see movies where somebody turning to what you call and they're coming in to get the money. They took the whole safe, bro. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Those type of things was happening. That, there is no justification. It was just a criminal move, man. That's all it was, man. You know, so, and there's no justification for it. So let me, let me, let me, uh, let me get to a couple questions because we have, we got a lot of questions, a lot of things. I know we've been having some good dialogue. Um, Danielle Watkins, and, she, and she's had a lot of different comments and she's she fully agrees there you know it's like you know this seems more than just a spontaneous riot or spontaneous protest not protesting looting because this wasn't protest at all i want to make sure that my stance is clear i don't view this as a protest at all i view no, this as out rioting and looting and she's in agreement that you know it seems like it's it seems like it was something bigger and something coordinated uh tracy zamron who's watching she asked the question and i'll ask this to you guys real quick do you think that people are getting paid to, to do this? You know, there, other people are reaping the benefits outside of um, this. Is there a financial component to it? Absolutely. I think um, Derek yes. did it earlier, man. Listen, every to everything, there's a system. And I think there's, when you go out and buy U-Haul trucks, tools, that's showing that you, you have a systematic plan set up yes. to go and do something. Oh, yeah. And if, where there's a system, there are leaders, there are people behind it. And and Derek can explain it better because he he's, he hit the nail on the head earlier today, and I I absolutely believe that there are people who are sitting on their couches and they're sending people out because they have already designed the system. Say, hey, listen, I need you to hit this store, this store, this store, this store, mm -hmm. and this absolutely. is how we're gonna get paid behind this, and we're gonna get absolutely. paid. This is what we're gonna do, and this is how we're gonna build um, a facade of wealth. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I'll let Derek carry on because he, he explained it greatly earlier today and yeah and I, it's just thank you Jeanette I, it's just the thing that we see as we talked earlier Stan it's an element and I don't want to talk too much about the Black Lives Movement you know Black Lives Matter movement but it's we it's elements behind it yep. you see what I'm saying people are using people's for protection you, you, when you have a when you have a criminal element underlining, underneath something, and they can use hundreds, thousands of people to cover up, they gonna do it, and that's what's happening right here. And I definitely believe somebody is behind doors getting paid without a doubt, without a doubt. We don't know who that is. I don't, we don't follow it deep enough, but it's somebody back there behind it, because this not how, this not how. When you want something, when you when you set out to do something for good, this is not how it's done. No, you see what I'm saying? So that's what we're seeing, man. So it's it's it's. It's crazy, and it's it, the underlining and the under the underbelly of it is terrible. I can tell. It's just bad. So let me move us in, into another part of the conversation. That is, the hot topic for the day has been as a follow-up to this because this this is starting to take on a life in and of itself. And that is one of the Black Lives Matters activists, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase or summarize uh, her her part of the conversation for what I was able to glean, and that was. What happened, the looting and rioting was reparations. Um, I know, <laughs> but, but, you know how we do a straight no chaser. We, 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 it's, everything is out there on the table. It's like, hey, we're about yeah, to get you, bro. <laughs> What are your thoughts on that comment and that statement when someone says, well, you know what? This was, this was for reparations and the companies have, these companies have insurance. That's what, that's I'm summarizing. Her comment, Shanir, let me come to you and then Derek, I'll, I'll come to you. Man, first of all, let me say this. 
any person who gets on national television and declares or tries to justify that any any element of criminality or any criminal element, you're wrong because what what you're doing, what you're taking just justification becomes the gasoline that you're tossing onto already onto a burning house. Yes. So you're just mm -hmm. you're just creating a bigger fire, and, a, mm -hmm. and you're you're turning a small fire into an inferno. So first of all, for any person to get up as a leader of a of an <laughs> organization and, and justify criminal behavior, something's wrong with you. You're ignorant. You're part of the problem. Yeah. Secondly, man, I don't. I said this earlier. I don't support the Black Lives Matter organization. I support the movement that that rests on the principle Black Lives Matter. I support that because Black Lives Matter. The organization that that woman got up and and and, and declared that justified the looting is reparation. Man, that's the most ignorant and silly thing I've ever heard in my life. Reparation is supposed to provide some level of of permanent freedom or bring you to a whole level where you you gain financial wealth or you gain generational wealth. They are that's why they're trying to pass this 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 act of reparation. They ain't asking they, they, people are not going fighting in Congress saying, oh, give give them a um, pair of Gucci shoes or a Gucci belt or Gucci hat. No, they're saying give every black family a minimum of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Every black person. That's what they're trying to really push for. Well, she talk, if you think a pair of Gucci shoes that's just gonna be worn out in what the next few months. You know what I'm saying? Because what they're going to do, they're going to keep wearing them all over and over again. They're going to be out there looking like a new fool. You know what I'm saying? With all that new stuff on, looking like a new fool. So at the end of the day, man, I think that is the most ignorant thing a leader of a so-called freedom-fighting organization can stand up and say. That is the most stupid and ignorant thing I've heard. I, that Man, that literally, every time you talk about that, just pissed me off. That ain't no reparations. Yeah. That is not rep. That ain't how you go about getting reparations, man. You're just stealing. I'm sorry. You're just stealing. And I'm I'm quite sure her, she probably got about like six, seven boxes in her closet because she done bought some shoes off somebody or some clothes off somebody because she felt because she feel that that's that's right. And that's just plain stupid. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel. You hit it, Derek. Ain't no sense of saying sorry, bro. That's <laughs> real. Right. That's that's real. That's 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 no leadership. You want to say lead? That's no leadership. Yeah, For somebody absolutely. to say something like that, that's not a leader. That's 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 an ignorant person that they put in a position that she shouldn't have. And that's that's the thing with that whole situation, is because, okay, to say Black Lives Matter and say it's a movement. Black Lives Matter is a movement. Black Lives Matter, man, is a is a life. You black. I'm black. Say, uh, uh, Stan is black. We black people. Our lives matter. That's what we feel. That's what you feel internally. It ain't about you walking out here and and uh, running around with signs or whatever. And for you to say something like that, reparations from stealing. Reparations are supposed to trickle down. <laughs> Hold on. Reparations, you know, is supposed to trickle down to the generation, <laughs> right? It's supposed to, you ain't Robin Hood stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. I mean, this right here, that that was the most ignorant thing I ever heard in my life, man. And so, and I, I mean you and you talking to a street dude. You a street, you was a street cat too, Shania. We we know what it's about, what it's like to be out in the street. So I'm not, I'm not going out there just going off on people who were doing whatever they was doing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. I think the movement was, I think whatever you did, that whole looting thing, that didn't have a, that didn't have a plan. It had a plan of criminal, it had a criminal plan. It didn't have no plan of making nothing better. And then for her to go out there talking about reparations, she probably was behind it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she probably was behind. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to go that far. But, but let's just see. I, 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 I just can't see that though, man. Here is straight no chair, so I don't have that type of liability insurance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, let, but no. Sorry, you know, scratch that. Scratch down. that. <laughs> let me look to your point. I agree. You know, let's look at reparations. Reparations and the concept of reparations. When you look back at at, at its initial inception. 
um, when it was discussed for African Americans, it was 40 acres and a mule. And what was that? It was to provide opportunity. It was to provide something that you can build and grow and pass down. That's what, rep that's what the concept of reparations stem from. Something that gave you a base that you can cultivate, that you can nurture, develop, and then pass down, whether it be op through opportunity or through generational wealth. When she said reparations, and, and, and I saw it, and it made my skin crawl. And here's the other thing, and I think someone touched on it. Uh, Charmaine touched on it. Um, indirectly, uh, Charmaine touched on it. And that is, it gave those people ammunition that had been waiting to say, see, I told you so. Those people, it gave them that, 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 that aha moment, that I caught you moment, so to speak. But when you talk about reparations, Reparations, let's just say you got the, 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 the 70 inch flat screen television. The best you're gonna sell it for is what? A thousand dollars on the street, 1500? What are you building off of that? No, you ain't selling that much, man. You like you said, you got the Gucci shoes, you, you don't wear those and those wear we're, we're off in a couple months. What are you building with that? So the idea that, or the, the, the fact that she would say that the, the, the idea was this is going to be reparations, she is clueless as to what reparations were built for. Now you're gonna go and knock off the Gucci store every, every week so you can get that $1,500 pair of shoes every day or every week or so so you can build that wealth? Well, that's a whole other conversation which is stupid in and of itself, but it just shows the level of ignorance. And I say ignorance in terms of lack of information, lack of knowledge that she had, especially as you touched on, her being a leader of people and her being, uh, for lack of a better term, a beacon that people are looking for guidance. And unfortunately, in this instance, it was misguided uh, leadership that, uh, that, that she shared with the masses when she made that comment. I don't know this individual personally, so I can't speak to her background. I can't speak to her education level. I can only speak to this comment that she made in terms of this was not, this was a very poor message and it, it did not resonate it did not resonate well, not only with people that were looking for that aha moment. See, told you, told you Black Lives Matter. They want to tear stuff up. They want to loot. They want to riot. It didn't resonate with them, but it also didn't resonate for people that understand that the Black Lives Matter movement is about the ideology, the Black Lives Matter, not the organization. And the two, the two can be separate. You can still, you can still support the Black Lives Matter movement like I do, without necessarily agreeing with the, the ideology and the actions of the organization. And I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see, especially with some of the things that have been happening. I think this would have been one of those times where sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. This probably would have been one of those times for um, an and, let, and, let, and let me say this thing. Reparations should never land you in jail. Reparations should never get, get you a... a, a Felony or a criminal or, or X on your back or something like that. How is and that it, reparations? And it, and if you get it, you receive it. You're going to jail for it. <laughs> Repar <laughs> that's, 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 I'll be playing it simple. That's not reparations. That's that's enslavement. That's self oppression. Let's if you receive. If you think that's reparations and it's going to put you in jail, that's not reparations. That's 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 criminal. That's still that's thievery. That's still right. <laughs> exactly. Let me just simplify for the people at home. I'm, I want to make sure you all hear me loud and clear. Reparations should not lead to incarceration. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Right. Reparations should not lead to incarceration. I want to, incarceration. I want to make sure that people understand that. That's a great point, Shanir. Yeah. Because it, it was not of it was not done in a spirit of of truth. It was not done in the spirit of well being. It was done with I mean, no intent and malice behind it. Let's just be real. She shouldn't have said that. It is. It's breaking into stuff and tearing stuff up and grabbing and snatching, that ain't never had nothing to do with reparations. So stop. She needs to stop. That I believe crazy. our ancestors would slap her in her mouth, man, if they were here, man. <laughs> They'd be like, sweetheart, you don't know what you're talking about. You need to sit down. My grandmother said, you need to go sit down somewhere. Yes. <laughs> she has no idea what she was talking about. And I think that was somebody that was looking for a rallying moment or a uh, 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 just looking for something to say, and 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 that was the first thing that came out of my mouth because I don't, I, I I just don't see the logic behind it, you know. But man, this is what I'm talking about. What makes it hard for us who have these platforms who are trying to bring some level of truth and convey truth is that people see her, and, and let me just say this: White America see her, 
um, other races see her and they think that she speaks for all African-Americans and she doesn't, you know what I'm saying? And so that's the sad part about it because guess what they're going to do? They're not, you know, your show is not going to be on ABC or NBC or Channel 9 News. This show right here is not going to be on there tonight. But guess what's going to be on that? That young lady standing before all America saying that there's justification for looting. That's the sad part about it. And I think that we, that's why I'm saying like we who know the truth, we need to make our platforms very, very boisterous. I mean, very loud. We need to be bombastic wherever we stand. We need to open our mouths and speak the truth. Because guess what? I remember a friend of mine, um, a preacher friend of mine, he, he said his grandfather before he passed, he said, he told him these words. He said, man, tell the truth and save the church. We already know that this country right now is being tore down because there's a man who just lied like nobody's business. You know what I'm saying? And so at some point, people have to tell the truth and save our community, save our culture, save our country. We have to stand up and tell the truth, man, and make it loud, man, because, you know, they, she's going to become an extension of, of, wait, let me say that, let me rewind it. She's going to become a false extension of us because she's not who, who we don't represent her at all. But people well, she doesn't on the represent side us. of the fence, yeah, people who are on the other side of the fence who are looking at us saying, you know what, I want to support your cause. What happened to George Floyd? What happened to Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown? I, I see it now, and, and I want to support you guys, and I'm with you guys. But then all of a sudden, when you go back, show back up to work, and you're sitting across the cubicle from them, and they looking at they said, no, I, I'm not with you because I just saw somebody look just like you say that looting is the thing. So now you got to go through this whole explanation of we don't support that. You know what I'm saying? That's the right. issue I'm having. Black leaders need to stand up and tell the truth, man. And she didn't tell the truth. So let me get to that. Let me get to that because I think that's a great segue. And you're right, Charmaine. Charmaine is, is watching. Um, John Lewis is, is turning over in his grave right now. Rest his soul. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask how this is something that's been discussed. And I think you hit it on the head. And I think it needs to be something that needs to be brought out and, and shared. And that is black leaders, black people need to stand up and tell the truth. And sometimes it may be the unpopular thing to say or do because you're you're contradicting another person of color. As we like to say, you're contradicting someone in front of company, you know, calling them out in front of company, meaning in front of other people, in front of other races, in front of other ethnicities. But I am a firm believer that the truth is the truth. And just because you're black or just because you're white doesn't give you a pass for you to say something that's not correct. And I know it's not correct. I think I'm doing myself and I think whoever's listening is, is it's, it's doing a disservice to them if the truth is not being shared or if I'm co-signing something that's a lie. What are your thoughts on people that say, well, you know, you shouldn't be disagree you know, with black people because we have it hard enough as it is. How do you have that conversation? Well, truth is truth. Anybody can get it. Great point. If, if you if you are wrong, you're wrong. See, it's not. If I'm in a room with a white man, he say something wrong, I'm gonna call him out. If I'm in a room with a brother, he say something wrong, I'm gonna call him out. Because the thing is that anybody can get it. If you lying, you lying. If you telling the, if you telling something that ain't right. If you're doing it, you're doing it. It's, it's just being right, doing the right thing, period. That's what it is. If you if you if you sit there and you stand for uh, if this white guy say something and it's like he's not right, but this black dude say the same thing and you still support him, you see what I'm saying? On what he's saying, you you just you're a part of it. So it's it's your obligation to say the right thing. It's your obligation to do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? It's your obligation to tell them people they're wrong. Like it's our obligation to tell that sister that when she said that she was wrong. Yeah. And, and, it, and Stan, it, it takes it takes courage, man. I mean, you got to have courage. You know, I say this all the time. You know, before the Lord changed my life, man, I represented what I represented, and I had courage in representing that. And it was all a lie. Now, if I had courage representing a lie, 
you know, for me not to represent the truth in courage would be less than less than who I am and what I've been called and created to do. I, I understand that man, the truth isn't popular. You know what I'm saying? And you saying you you witnessed some of the stuff I, you know, how how I'll go at it. I don't back down. If I know it's, if it's the truth and it's gonna help, I don't back down. I don't go alone to get along. And I've come to understand, man, as being a leader over of a congregation of people that the worst thing you can ever do is feed them lies. The worst thing you can ever do is tell tell them non-truths and, and not be courageous enough to tell them, tell them what's what. Because if you want to see them grow, you want to see them move forward, you want to see them prosper, tell them the truth. Because that's the only thing that's going to liberate them. Truth liberated us. You know what I'm saying? The truth of Black Lives Matter is a liberating truth. We matter. And until we embrace that truth and what it means that our lives matter, our lives don't matter if, you know, we, we can't say our lives matter if we're killing each other. We can't say our lives matter if we're looting and, and doing all this stuff. We show the truth that our lives matter by standing up and fighting for justice the right way. The right way. Not, yeah. not engaging in criminal acts of criminality or criminal acts or doing things uh, that go against, that would land us in positions of, uh, of, of incarceration. Dr. King and um, um, Don, Don, Senator Lewis and so many others, man, they had courage in leadership and they told the truth. They told a white racist America, you're not gonna treat us like this. And so be it, whatever happens, you can, you, can, you can shoot us, you can bust our heads, whatever you do, we still gonna tell you the truth and we're gonna stand for the truth. And I think that what until we get to that, that understanding, we're gonna always be in this low place of life because we afraid, we just wanna go along to get along. And, and I'm gonna say this last thing, telling the truth and being being a person of truth means that you can't be bought. Yes. You won't compromise. And that's important to me. I'll tell you, so I'll never forget, man, this, um, I had, I have this thing, you know, I'm just, you know, about political leaders coming to my church to, um, um, you know, campaign. So I, I was always against it. I was like, nope, nope, you're not coming to my church to campaign. You're not coming, showing up in my services to campaign. And so one of my mentors told him, said, said man, you know, as a, as a spiritual leader, you have to understand what's, what's out there and just help your people, people make the right decisions on with their vote and all that. So I said, okay, I understand. But I'll never forget this judge came. He wanted this white judge. He said, I want to come. The guy called me up, said, man, um, we want to come and we just want, he want to share with you what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. And they'll give you a check. You know what I told him? I said, I don't want your money. I said, he can come, but I don't want your money. So he came, he shared his thing, his, his truth and all this stuff. So then next thing I know, on the way out, he stopped my deacon. The same guy stopped my deacon. He said, hey, here, get us to um, Pastor Austin. And my deacon told him, he said, man, he said, he don't want that. He don't want that money. And I told him, I don't want your money. I want your resources. I want your truth. That's more important. You give us the right resources, we'll make our own money. And that's how I stand. Until people get to that point where you can't be bought, you won't compromise, none of that, man. We, you know, these leaders are gonna keep flailing in the wind, man. And that's just that's just the way it is. So, so with that, um, and, and Charmaine, she had a great comment, um, right or wrong. Right or wrong shouldn't be based on race, it's based on facts. Great point, kind of to your point. Um, to, to that point, um, if we kind of wrapping, looking at wrapping us up here, because I want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. If you could have one hard ask in terms of how do we get over this, because we're talking about our second wave of rioting. And, and what, one thing that we haven't touched on, we're talking about downtown. We haven't talked about the ripple effect, what, what, which is what I call the ripple effect. If you've ever been in California, you have the epicenter of earthquake, but there's a ripple effect. And there the tremors move throughout the, uh, the state, the nation, whatever the case would be. I'm here in the South suburban area. And as, as it relates to what transpired downtown with the rioting and looting, um, I'm impacted because they shut down businesses here. They blocked off things. They've taken um, concrete barriers and placed them at the entrances of malls so people can't drive their cars. Uh, they've taken dirt mounds. They've taken dirt and made five foot mounds of dirt so you can't drive into the drive lot, driving the the driveway, excuse me, areas of certain businesses. So basically, they cut off access. So even though I'm 
25 minutes from downtown and you know there was there was nothing that happened out here the precautions that are being taken out here um are a direct result of what transpired down there so there is a ripple effect to this it's not just happening downtown um it, there is cause and effect if you can have excuse me one hard ask in terms of something that you would like to see moving forward to help us through this situation and this issue, if you could have one hard ask, what would that be? What would that look like? Well, I'm gonna let Shania go, but like, I ask for somebody to do something, I can't see it happening. I, I, I don't really have a hard ask. So I'm gonna let Shania, because my thing is, that uh, unless all this stuff had to happen in house, in homes, you had to teach your children, teach your people to be right and do the right things in home, right? Now that the element has grown, it's out there. You see what I'm saying? It's going to take an outside source to come in and take that away. I, I, I'm... I really don't want to get into the elements of what I think is going on, but it's uh you got that hard ass, and I'm like, we know what we can to, we, to move this in a certain way, huh? What say what? Why do you think about it? We'll come back to you, Shanir. Do you have a hard ass? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I would ask. I would ask a question. So why can't we no how can we embrace truth? How can we embrace truth? I think that when we ask that question, when we find an answer to that question that many, how can we embrace truth? I think that would be the hard question because people don't know how to embrace truth. I think that that's the that answer needs to be given or that, that answer needs to be made known to everyone. And I think with that, I think piggybacking off of that, you know, how do we embrace truth? I think the first thing we need to do is start speak to your point, start speaking truth and accountability. That you start to hold people accountability, I'm sorry, hold people accountable um, in the presence of misinformation, in the presence of lies, even if it's like you said, not the popular opinion, but holding people accountable, you know, um, where you see, if you have an if you have an opportunity to right a wrong, then you know try to make the opportunity right. I think one of my hard asks would be, and I'm not going to waver on this, and I think that the community needs to hold those individuals that are committing crimes accountable. I know it's going to be a challenge, but from a community standpoint, it starts in the home. You touched on it earlier. You touched on it earlier. The mothers, yeah. the the family members that you know they're they're harboring uh weapons they're harboring some of these stolen goods they're well hey you know what we got a we got a tv out the deal or you know th that are that are turning a, a a blind eye to some of the criminal activity um and i understand it, it can be difficult to turn your child in but the first start the first part of that is prevention hey where are you going at, at one o'clock in the morning why are you leaving the house at one o'clock in the morning where are you going at one o'clock in the morning you know, those types of things, those are the things that you can do to stop, to deter some of this activity. You know, so my heart ask would be the accountability from a community standpoint, and it starts within the home. You know, those, those family members that are pumping them up or that are covering for them or that are turning the other cheek, stop doing it because all you're doing is enabling bad behavior, criminal behavior, and it's not, it's gonna lead to nothing good. And then from there, you know, peer pressure, here's the thing, and I've had this conversation with friends, Peer pressure works both ways. You can have negative peer pressure or you can have positive peer pressure. You know, you, Derek might be the one that's about to go out. Well, you know, I'll put it on me. I might be the one that's about to go out. They'll snatch me a TV and I'm, I'm going to grab Derek and Derek say, oh man, you know what? I'm gonna stay in, man. You know what? It's not even worth it. You know, you don't know who that one person may be to influence you. And then next thing you know, you've got somebody else that says, oh, well, I'm going to get Derek and stand. Oh, you know what? We stay in, we're gonna play Xbox with the case would be. But it starts with that accountability. It starts with that positive peer pressure. If you can just turn to flip that one, then you can start to flip others. You know, so that would be my hard ask. I would ask that the community 
um, because you know who the individuals are in these communities that are com committing crimes. I worked in the community center and I knew who was committing crimes, you know, just based off the conversation that people were having and the conversation that I had to have with people. And I'm, I'm sure Shitnir, you've had people that have talked to you about different things and challenges that they're dealing with. And Derek, the guys that you mentored, you know, guys on the street that, that have had those conversations. So we have this information as people that are outside the home, outside the community, then the community definitely has the information and can be a bigger impact. So that would be my hard ask to have the community members and the household have these hold these individuals accountable and start to flip that behavior. That would that would be a wish. Yeah. I, I wish. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that so, a wish. Uh, just real quick, I'm gonna get to some of the comments. Um, Lori Bass, her heart asks is that I would run for president. You know what, Lori, if I didn't have so much that I would have to put my kids under duress, I'm not worried about me. I just don't want my kids to have to deal with, with some of the things that uh, may come out, you know. You know, Papa, <laughs> wait, as a, I'm a quote baby boy, you know, daddy need a life too. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I've actually thought about running, running for office. I, I gave it a thought, um, I gave it a serious thought about two years ago, but realistically, I just didn't want to, because I've, I've had some fun and I, I, I own it and I'm, I'm transparent about it. I just didn't want to put my kids through that, that, uh, that experience. But yes, it's something I thought about and that was running for office. Um, let's see, we've got Tracy Zamrin. Um, you know, she's not a, a, a supporter of number 45. She's a good friend of mine. She's not a supporter of number 45 also. And she said she just wishes at one of these press conferences uh, that someone would, would yell out liar, you know, when he, when he goes into his rants. She knew you talked about that earlier. Man, and listen. Be her hero. Um, I wish I could be one of the reporters. I'd be like, man, why are you sitting that line, man? <laughs> so, but you would last about you would last through the first question and a half before they snatch a press credential. <laughs> I get fired immediately. They'd be like you can't go. They wouldn't let me. Uh, they wouldn't let, let me in the door. <laughs> <laughs> they look at me and say, "I know he finna act the fool." They got you the Uh Let's see, Christina Gardner. Christina Gardner. She she works with a, a, a number of different inner, inner city uh, schools and youth. Um, and one of the challenges that she's dealing with, and that is, uh, she's aware that many of the, the uh, young people that she works with commit crimes, but as she's a social worker, she, you know, she tries to work to deter that, but she's aware of some of the, the uh, young people that are committing crimes, and she tries to work with them to deter that type of activity. Um, Charmaine Emmanuel brought up a good point, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but how can a village raise a child if the community is, or the village is divided? And that's one of the things that we have to do, you know, or, or that could be looked at, I should say. And that is, how do we bring the community, how do we bring the village back together? Even if it's just a small village, a small tribe. So, Christina Garden, excuse me, clarified, she works at 19 alternative school campuses. So she's seen the gamut of individuals and worked with the gamut of individuals, so. But gentlemen, it's been a great conversation. Um, any last words before, before we uh, break for the evening? Well, all I want to say, man, I appreciate you, Stan. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep providing a platform where truth can be spoken to this generation and to this world, man, because we definitely need it, whether it's through the uh, agency of um, sports talk, um, social issues, whatever, you know, just just keep telling the truth, saying to you, Brother Derek, always good to see you, my, my brother, man. Uh, keep too, doing it. Keep being a mentor and keep being a mentor to those out there, man, because we need it, man. Big bro, um, I try to do what I do, man. You know, yeah. it's it's not it's not easy. You know, I see the different elements and you know, um Jehovah got me grounded, man. You know what I'm there saying? You go. So there you go. So um the elements, I see the elements, I try to move people in a different direction. You know what I mean? That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, or try to give them some game, bro. You know what I mean? And and I thought I'd be dead at 30. I'm 50. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So try to get them on how to make it to 50, man. You know what I'm saying? How to make it up here, man. You know, it ain't, it's just, you know, that's all, man. We we just got to keep doing what we got to gotta do, man. And uh, have an element of love in your heart for people, man. Yeah. You know? So. And it's, even though how difficult it may be, <laughs> you know what I mean? But you still gotta, you gotta, you gotta come from a perspective of love, man. 
period. Great. Well, thank you both to Pastor Austin, to Derek Anderson. I'd like to thank everybody that that uh, watch the show, Joshua Iverson, Danielle Watkins, Lori Bass, Tracy Zamron, Charmaine Emanuel, Ken Brown. Uh, I mean, we got a, we had a whole list, uh, Charlie Smile, a number of people that, that tuned in, Melissa Martinsky. Uh, shout out to everybody that watched the show. Thank you to everybody for your comments, for your feedback, your questions. I know we didn't get a chance to get to all of them, but we did have some good dialogue around some of the challenges that the city is facing, especially in light of what's transpired within the last 48 hours. So. Thank you to everybody. And that's another segment as we give it to you, Straight No Chaser. This ends our last segment. Thank you all. Peace. I love you, brother.